So the intro video left off right at this slide, still kind of talking about what are things that microbes need or require to grow, things that make them happy, things that help them grow. We're going to continue that with a little bit, but we're going to talk about more of what they need, maybe not just a substance they need, but sometimes they actually need each other. And there are various types of, get it to go for there's a thing I'm like, there are various types of associations that they live in, some that are required for them to grow, to grow happily. So we're going to, there's three different types of biological associations that we're going to talk about. One are antagonistic relationships. So these are true organisms that live together. One's going to benefit from that relationship. One is not. So one's going to benefit at the expense of another. Um, an example I have on here is viruses, that yes, viruses benefit from living in a cell, but the cell does not, is harmed in some way. There are synergistic relationships where two, three, or more organisms live together and they all benefit by living together. And then there is also another type of association we'll talk about that are called symbiotic relationships means these are organisms that always live together. They've developed over time an advanced relationship that they can't survive without each other. Now, that doesn't mean it's always beneficial for all of them. Some have developed this relationship, you know, over years. Sometimes you know, one's generally gonna benefit, but some are not harmed, they don't benefit. Sometimes they do get harmed, but don't die. Now, Mike, but there's some type of complex relationship where they are always found together. One example of these, um, well, it's a symbiotic relationship, but synergistic as well. Yes, you can be a symbiotic and synergistic if everyone's benefiting. And one of those is a biofilm. Now, a biofilm, it's a synergistic relationship, so they're all benefiting. These are all bacteria that are all living together. They're all getting some benefit out of living together. And, and I'm like, how they live together and their benefit is this biofilm is they all live together, but they create a film or a covering of bacteria. So all together, they work together, they form this big matrix fluid substance using their slime layers, using the fimbri, and they will completely cover surfaces. Now, when they completely cover surfaces, these are bacteria here landing on a surface like our teeth, and they begin to accumulate and form this nice sticky matrix. Now, some benefits that they get out of this, same picture, and I'm like, is it allows them to attach to each other easier. If there's something there they can attach to, it allows them to attach to surfaces easier. Sometimes they might get washed away, but now they've got something sticky to stick to. And by all living together, it helps um, allow them to get some of the nutrients they need. And I'm like that they kind of share the nutrients that are available and can trap various nutrients as well in that matrix. And it helps protect them. When they've got the sticky matrix, they're not washed off as easily. Now, Mike, if you've got bacteria floating around in your mouth and in your saliva, just rinsing with water can get rid of a bunch of them. If they are now stuck to your teeth with the sticky matrix, water's not going to rinse them off anymore. Water's just going to flow right over that sticky matrix. Only way you get rid of them then, brush your teeth. you got to physically brush them off. Now, these biofilms, any kind of biofilm, not just on your teeth, they can form just about on any kind of surface. And they can form in medical devices. Tubing that we, in the video, that hunting the nightmare bacteria, some of the tubing bacteria can be found in and grow in and cover inside of tubings on various types of medical equipment. And pretty much every part of the mucous membrane of your digestive tract, including inside your mouth, is gonna have a covering of bacteria. Now what attracts them to each other and to these various surfaces to stick to is a process called quorum sensing, that the bacteria that stick first start to send out these different types of chemicals. And the chemicals they send out, almost to me, I like to think of it as kind of like their, their little, I don't know, Batman symbol. It's like, hey, we found a great place to live. And those chemicals attract other bacteria to that place. 
Again, the more the merrier. And I'm like, it really is strength in numbers when it comes to bacteria. So they send out chemicals to attract other organisms to that area. They don't even have to be the same bacteria. As you can see, there's a couple different bacteria on this picture. Now, the problem is microorganisms are more harmful when they are working together. An example is when all these microorganisms work together on your teeth as they sit there, and if you don't brush them off, those bacteria, every time you eat something, you're feeding your bacteria. If you didn't know that, you're feeding your bacteria when you eat and drink anything sugary. And those bacteria, when they break down various foods, and especially sugary foods and sugary beverages, they ferment that sugar and release an acid. Now, acid is not good for your teeth. It wears away at your enamel and causes cavities. It's one of the main reasons why they say brush your teeth. It prevents cavities. The reason why is you are brushing off the bacteria because the bacteria are producing that acid to lead to cavities. Now, the double whammy is if you're a person that likes to drink sugary sodas, one, the sugar's feeding your bacteria to produce acid, and two, sodas themselves have acid in their ingredients. So not only are you feeding your bacteria to produce an acid, you are drinking various, some type of fluid that also has an acid in it, so it's kind of double whammy for harming your teeth. So, you know, our best way is what are ways we can prevent biofilm formation? How can we prevent bacteria from sticking to teeth? We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, and how are, can we prevent bacteria from sticking to various medical devices? Still working on that, that as well. Again, we try to prevent them from attracting each other and working in numbers. Now, other than, you know, we know that bacteria can live in these different types of relationships, sometimes we do want to grow bacteria. So this first part of the PowerPoint really is all, what are things that they need to grow? The second part of this PowerPoint now is, how do we, how do we grow them? I mean, yes, we have to provide them with nutrients, but what are some ways we can grow bacteria so we can study them? Now, anytime I say the word culture bacteria, culture means grow. So if we're culturing microorganisms, we are growing microorganisms. And the basic uh, way of growing a microorganism, an inoculum, fancy word for a sample, is introduced into a medium. That means some type of nutrient-rich environment, whether it's in a broth or whether it's on in some type of media plate or an auger plate. But that sample of bacteria is introduced into some type of medium that organisms can grow. Now, types of specimens that we can try to grow microorganisms from. There are environmental specimens. This is if we want to see what's growing in ponds, soils, lakes, and rivers. Don't always want to know what's growing in the Mississippi because there's lots of stuff out there, but sometimes we want to know. Uh, clinical, oh, I forgot to make that red. Clinical specimens, and I'm like, these are samples that come directly from a patient. This is helpful when you're diagnosing your patient. And stored specimens, these are coming from a freezer. Now, originally they came from either a patient or some environmental sample, but when we're working with bacteria in our lab, we're not going straight to a patient or an environmental uh, area to go get them. We're pulling these bacteria from a freezer, um, and I'm not sure where they exactly originated from. Culture, again, is just kind of the act of cultivating our growing microorganisms. Now, when we're talking about pure cultures, we're talking about growing one organism only. And just a couple other terms, and I'm like, one is when we're talking about a colony forming unit. This means all bacteria that we grow all came from one single progenitor or parent cell. And so we're gonna be growing bacteria that all came from one bacteria cell. And yes, they can form colonies. That's why they're called a colony forming unit because one tiny little bacteria landed and it reproduced and reproduced and reproduced. And now we can see it as these different types of colonies, and if we want, we can take that bacteria from one colony and grow it up and more on, on a plate. But when we're talking about colony forming units, this is, you know, one parent cell landed and formed a colony. Anytime we want to grow or culture microorganisms, we do always want to practice aseptic technique, just prevents contamination or limits contamination. Again, it's things in lab like keeping those plates upside down, making sure you incinerate loops before you use them, don't cough on your plates, things like that. Now, two very common ways of 
isol growing and then isolating bacteria for isolated colonies, one is the streak plate. I'm not going to go too much into details because this is what we did in lab. That yes, you're just decreasing the quantity of bacteria with every uh, into each different quadrant so that you eventually get some isolated colonies. Another way you could also get isolated colonies on your plate, it's called a pour plate method. It's through a whole bunch of different dilutions. We could take the broth that you know has lots and lots and lots of bacteria in it, and you could dilute it. You could do one to 10 dilutions into other broth tubes, and you could pour a known amount of that broth on your plate until you eventually figure out the dilution that allows you to get isolated colonies. Now, we don't do that, it is, a common method of doing it. We don't do it because that's a lot of extra broth tubes and we can just do this to give our isolated colonies. So it uses less resources. Get through those. Now, growing the organisms, they do need some type of media to grow them on. And although we can grow some on, or we can grow some of them in a nutrient broth, a lot of our organisms are grown on auger plates. Now an auger comes from a thickening agent from red algae. So out in the ocean in various seas, you can find red algae and yes, they have something in there to thicken that media up. So it kind of gives, gives that consistency of that thick jello. Now, as the pictures, there are lots of types of media to grow organisms, about every color under the sun to grow a whole bunch of different organisms, but Although we have lots of different types of plates and tubes and media to grow organisms, most organisms or most bacteria have not been able to grow in some type of culture media. We have not been able to mimic every single type of growing condition that some of these organisms need. Some of them are very picky and some of them are just not gonna grow happily on some type of media. But we've got a lot of choices. Now, other than plates, which we've been using in lab, and we will continue to use this semester, we do sometimes use slant tubes. And I'm like, this one's called a citrate tube, and we'll use it later this semester. But what's nice about the slant tube is sometimes you don't know if your bacteria is an aerobic bacteria or an anaerobic bacteria. And if you don't know, you don't know exactly what kind of conditions to provide it to try to get it to grow. If you don't know, we can go straight to a slant tube. What's nice is a slant tube, while the media is really hot when it gets poured into the tubes, we just tilt it a little bit while it hardens, and you get this nice big slant area of the tube. It's a large surface area for aerobic bacteria to grow. The butt region, and yes, it's called the butt of the tube, the oxygen can't get all the way to the bottom of the tube. And so if you have anaerobic bacteria, they're gonna grow down in that butt region of the tube. So it's one type of media that has two different types of oxygen areas. You've got an aerobic area and an anaerobic area. So you can kind of see where your bacteria are gonna grow. Now I put the definitions on here, but some terms for different types of media that we'll use this semester. One, defined media, means we know exactly what is in that media. We know every compound, every sugar, we know every protein, we know everything that is in there. Complex media is more common. We know various things that we've added, but some of the substances, the nutrients we've added, are larger, more complex substances. And we know that they will start to break down in that media. Sometimes they break down naturally, sometimes the bacteria break it down. And as these larger substances break down, you now have nutrients that are partially broken down and we don't know the exact ratio of how much is broken down. Just an example, I'm like beef, yeast, and I'm like soy, milk, a lot of these have larger proteins in them. And as they start to break down, it's broken down into various types of amino acids and we don't know the exact ratio. So we know there's lots of nutrients in there, we just don't know the exact chemical makeup of it. A selective media we're gonna use this semester, and there are added substances in that media. And the ones we're gonna use this semester are all gonna be on plates, so there's certain substances added to the plates that are either gonna favor or inhibit the growth of a particular organism. So we can stop the growth of one type of organism and favor the growth of another type of organism. Helps us narrow down different organisms. 
I'm going to say, I'm like, well, we'll give you an example and I'll go back and forth. One example, nutrient auger. This doesn't have blood cells in it, but it's another nutrient auger. A lot of times we just want to grow anything and everything. However, if you suspect that your patient has a fungal infection and a nutrient auger grows everything and anything, this is growing bacteria everywhere, which when, or, when they've got lots of organisms, they compete for space and nutrients. And you can't really see if they're suffering from any type of fungal infection because there's so many bacteria taking over the plate. An example of the selective media, it's a media called Sabarot auger. It has a lower pH, which inhibits bacteria from growing. So we don't care about the bacteria. We want to know if a patient has a fungal infection. And so the sample will inhibit bacterial growth, so they're not fighting for any of those nutrients or space. And we can now see if there is fungus in that patient sample. And so it's, again, selecting for fungal infections by inhibiting bacterial or by inhibiting bacterial bacteria. A differential media means we're going to see the media change based on some type of chemical reaction. I just like to think of it as that media, that plate, that tube, whichever it is that we're using, it's going to look different. There's going to be some type of chemical reaction in that media that's going to show us that the bacteria did something to the media. An example, our blood augers that we're using are differential media. I'm like, right away when you hold up a blood auger, they are nice and bright, blood red, but some bacteria can break those red blood cells down. And I'm like, some don't, and the background looks just as red. Others break down the red blood cells a little bit, and they kind of produce a greenish color to the media. And other bacteria will completely break down the red blood cells. So there's none whatsoever, and you can actually see through the plate. Some of your initial plates, depending on where you swabbed, you saw that already in lab, that you can see through the plate. That's a difference in media, so it's a differential media. We can see some differences. And the last type of media is transport media. It's just used to carry clinical samples to the lab, and I've got another slide coming up talking about that. Now, talking the differences between selective and differential, you can have a plate or a media that's both. And one of these that we're going to use this semester is called a McConkie auger. It's both selective and it's differential. So it selects or inhibits for one organism, but we can also see differences in colors. Now, this is to show you some examples, just on how the McConkie works compared to a nutrient auger. So nutrient, we really want to grow everything and anything. And on this plate, we put Staph aureus and E. coli. Grows, both of them grow just fine. On a McConkie plate, Staph aureus, not growing. E. coli is. Now, big difference between E. coli and Staph aureus. E. coli is gram-negative. Staph aureus is gram-positive. McConkie auger selects for gram-negative bacteria by inhibiting the growth of all gram-positives. So without even doing a gram stain to know whether bacteria are gram negative or positive, you can look to see if they grow in a McConkie plate. I'm like, it really is a great plate for helping differentiate types of bacteria. Now, on this last plate, still a McConkie plate, I have E. coli, we know it's gonna grow, but I switched up, this isn't Staph aureus, this is Salmonella enterica, yes, the same bacteria that can give you Salmonella poisoning. Uh, both of these are gram-negative bacteria. You can see they're both growing fine. However, I'm like, although they are both growing, because they are both gram-negatives, we're looking for a color change because it's a differential media. Now, the McConkie color change. One, there are two colors shown on here. The original plate looks kind of a pinkish color. I'm like, on a McConkie plate, what you're looking for is that the bacteria themselves will show up as a nice, bright pink. And I'm like, it looks a little more burgundy on here. In lab, we'll see a nice, bright pink. Although this can, the background can turn a little yellow, that's other things that are happening that we don't care about. What we're looking for on a McConkie plate this semester is we're looking to see if the colonies turn bright pink. It means those 
those particular bacteria are pulling some of these indicators, this colorful indicator that's in the media, into their colonies. And so we see a color change, so the bacteria look different instead of the media itself. Other than using plates, because we do use a lot of plates this semester, we'll look at some tubes as well. And again, we're looking for color changes for differential media. And the original color of the tube is kind of this dark burgundy brown, but what we're looking for to know if the bacteria can do something is we're looking for a difference in color, and yes, it's a big difference in color. It turns a nice bright yellow. And you can even see sometimes they'll put these inverted tubes up there uh, inside of them to trap any gas bubbles. It's another thing you can look for to see if the various organisms produce gas. Now, as I said before, transport media is used to carry clinical or patient samples to the lab so we can for diagnosis. Now, my little note on here though is one, getting patient samples to the lab is very important. I bolded it for a reason. Main reason, I'm like, the sooner you can get the bacteria to the lab from your patient sample, the more likely you're going to be able to isolate the bacteria, grow the bacteria, and ID it. If you wait too long, some of the bacteria from that patient sample might start to die. And I'm like, which means by the time they get to the lab, one, they might not be there, or two, they might be not in high enough quantity uh, of what's there that we would say that, oh yes, that patient does have that particular bacterial disease because we killed them all and so they don't look like they're there anymore. So we have to transport these bacteria. We want to keep them in about the same number. So if a patient has a thousand bacteria when you picked them up on a swab, when he get to lab, we want to put that swab in some type of media, not to grow them, but just not to kill them. So that, so that thousand bacteria stays in about the same amount of quantity. It helps us ID the patient uh, diseases. Now, some special culture techniques. Again, some of these, you know, we have some picky organisms. One, there are animal and cell cultures that we can do. Again, there are some plates, there's some augers, there's some broths that we just can't grow the organisms. We haven't been able to mimic what these organisms need. So sometimes we just have to give them exactly what they want. They want to grow in a particular animal, they want to grow in a particular cell. Examples of things where we ha haven't been able to grow them in any type of artificial media, uh, viruses. Viruses have to get inside of a cell, hijack the cell for them to grow. So we have to provide them cells to grow in. Now, and I'm like, the cells are always in a nutrient broth because we've got to keep the cells alive. And I'm like, and the broth is always pink. I'm not sure what's in there that makes it pink, but they're always in some type of pink broth. So we're going to grow the cells, then add the viruses to grow those cells. Syphilis and bacteria, the bac syphilis and leprosy, the bacteria that cause those, also haven't been able to mimic any type of media that can grow them very well. So we'll actually grow them in the animal, the armadillo. We'll talk later why, but we just haven't been able to recreate any of these medias. An enrichment culture, it's a type of selective media, but instead of in inhibiting some type of organism, we're really trying to grow some type of organism. So we're going to add a whole bunch of a limiting factor, the thing that usually limits uh, growth for organisms because there's not enough of it. We're going to add a whole bunch of that and make one particular organism or group of organisms really happy. We're going to give them exactly what they need so we can get a large quantity of these bacteria to grow. And then two other types of special culture techniques, which we're going to do a little bit in lab. One, there are some bacteria that need a lower amount of oxygen to grow. They're not anaerobic, they still need oxygen, but they like smaller quantities, and we can grow them in a candle jar. Then there are organisms that are anaerobic, which means they cannot grow in the presence of any oxygen whatsoever. But if we want to grow them, we can put them in a gas pack jar, which takes the oxygen out of that, the air. Now, in a lab, candle jar. You may have already seen some sitting over on the back counter in our lab. Again, the candle that burns, that candle, as that flame is inside of there, it is 
burning up or it is using up the oxygen that's in there, but not all of the oxygen. It uses up enough oxygen until that low oxygen puts that flame out. So it's not an anaerobic environment, but it's a low oxygen environment. And then we've got the gas pack jar that we can put our plates in there or tubes in there. And then we open up this little gas pack. There's a reason why it's called that. This pack releases hydrogen gas which mixes with the oxygen gas, and when you put some hydrogens together and some oxygen together, it produces water. But it removes, it binds up all of the oxygen that's in there. So all of the oxygen gas that's in that jar is now bound up in water. And so it's now an anaerobic environment. Now, if we wanna keep, so we grew bacteria, but if we wanna keep them for longer periods of time, there's a couple ways we can do it. One is refrigerating. It's why we have a refrigerator and a lab off to the side is we pull bacteria out of the incubator and we put them in the refrigerator for short periods of time. They can hang out in there, kind of just literally chilling out, chilling out, for about a week, maybe two weeks, and then they aren't so happy anymore. If we want to keep our organisms longer than that, then we would freeze them. And not just your basic freezer that you would have at home. This needs to be negative 50 to negative 95 degrees Celsius. Um, on average, we try to deep freeze organisms at negative 80. Most deep freezers are set at negative 80. There's, an, there's a lot of research out there that negative 80 or colder keeps organisms best. And we can keep them in those freezers for years. If we want to keep them longer than that, decades, maybe centuries, because the CDC wants to keep copies of everything forever, uh, they do a process known as lyophilization. It's your basic freeze drying. You remove the water before you freeze it, because water can damage organisms as you freeze it, because water expands. And so by freeze drying it, freeze drying it, you remove the water, and they can live for decades, if not longer. Now, while the organisms are growing, we've made them happy. Organisms or bacteria grow by a process known as binary fission, which the bi in binary fission means two. Fission means split, so these organisms split into two. So when you're growing bacteria, if you start with one bacteria, they double their chromosome, they double their DNA, they grow larger, and they split into two. That's it. There's no exciting mitosis type of steps. There's no metaphases or anaphases, anything like that. They just double their chromosome and grow larger and split in two. Now, depending on the organism, kind of depends on how long this process takes. How long it takes for them to double their chromosomes, grow larger and split into two, it's called the generation time. Sometimes also just called the doubling time because once you split into two, you've now doubled. Depending on the organism, some can do this 30 minutes. Some organisms, if you make them nice and happy, can do it in 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Some might take a couple hours. It really kind of depends on the organism itself and how happy you made them. But a generation time, if you have bacteria and a lot of bacteria, their generation time is about 30 minutes, give or take a few minutes. Now, I'm like, that means every 30 minutes they are doubling. That means you can get extremely rapid growth in a short amount of time. Now this extremely rapid growth is called logarithmic growth. Normal species grow rhythmically. It's a nice, slow growth. Bacteria are doubling. They are doubling, 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 and you can get a lot of organisms extremely fast. Now, on your next test, there's going to be a math question. Now, I'm like, calculating, you're going to have to figure out how many bacteria you have after a certain amount of time if I tell you what the generation time is. So I'm going to give you my example now. And again, I'll show you the answer on here. And you can pause this at any time if you want to try to figure it out before I pop the answer up. But if I tell you that up one particular bacteria's generation time is five minutes. I don't know if they're ever that small, but I'm gonna say that a generation time is five minutes, and you're gonna start with 10 bacteria present. Now, you always have to start with some bacteria. You can't start with no bacteria and magically get some. So we're gonna start with 10 bacteria, and they're gonna double every five minutes. 
So if you start with 10 and they double every five minutes, how many bacteria are you going to have after just 15 minutes? If you want, you can pause us and try to do it yourself. I'm like, otherwise, I'm going to show you the answer. And again, we start with 10. Means after five minutes, they double. So 10 now become 20 after five minutes. After another five minutes, that 20 has now doubled to 40. So we've got 10 minutes that's gone by. Five minutes right here to double, five minutes right here to double. But we have five more minutes before we get to 15 minutes, and they're going to double again. Now you have 80 bacteria. So after 15 minutes, you have 80 bacteria. And again, another five minutes, 160. Another five minutes, 320. You can start to get really high numbers very, very quickly. Now there's going to be a math question. Won't be these same numbers. And I'm like, but you're going to have a, a math question on your next test where I'm going to give you a generation time. I'm going to give you a starting number of bacteria. And I'm going to ask you how many bacteria after or a certain number of minutes. I try to pick nice, easy numbers that, in theory, you shouldn't need a calculator for because um, you're just going to do several generation times. Now, typical microbial growth, when you put bacteria on a media plate or in any type of broth, it goes through various phases or stages. Right away, when you put your microorganism on a plate, like you did in lab, first you're just going to have a lag phase. You're not going to see a lot of microorganisms growing. You didn't magically start seeing colonies show up right away on your plate. Partly they're adjusting to their environment. They're like, oh, this is a great place to live, and let me check it out. They're also starting to make various enzymes to break down nutrients. It's like, oh, great, they pro we provided them some sugar, and well, let's make some various enzymes that can break those sugars down so that they can start to grow. As soon as they've adjusted, that's when they hit that logarithmic or exponential phase. It's super fast growth, that super fast doubling time. And it's during this logarithmic growth is our best time for gram staining. Because those bacteria, you should have all living bacteria happily doubling. Then at some point, they're going to go through the stationary phase. They're going to start to run out of nutrients. They've made waste products as they're breaking things down, and those waste products aren't good for them, and you start to have dying cells. And so they go through a stationary phase. So some bacteria are still growing, but it's the same number of bacteria that are dying. If we gram stained at this stage, you would see dead bacteria, which means they're not going to gram stain accurately. A lot of times what happens is gram positive bacteria, purple, show up as pink. And I'm like, because their cell walls are starting to break down as they are dying. So you're not going to get the most accurate gram stain in the stationary phase. And then the death phase, you have cells that are dying faster than they're being produced. So we try to pull microorganisms and your plates out of the incubator in 24 hours, because that's when they're the happiest, when they're in that logarithmic growth phase. Now that we know how they grow in generation times, is, well, how can we measure how many bacteria are there. We want to know how many bacteria are there. There are various ways we can measure them. Now there's some that don't require any incubation whatsoever. We're not going to physically count them. We don't have to incubate. We don't have to count them on a plate. Uh, these are called direct methods, so they don't require any incubation whatsoever. You can get really fast numbers without waiting 24 hours. Two of them are called electronic counters. See, they need some type of machinery. And I'm like, one's called a Coulter counter, and in a broth, and I'm like, it's pour this broth that we know has lots of bacteria in it, is poured into a, uh, a specific type of machine called the Coulter counter, and all the bacteria cells that are in there are going to interrupt an electrical flow. And the machine counts. Every time a microbe interrupts the electrical flow, it counts it, and it can make a pretty accurate estimate of how many organisms are in that broth based on how many times that electrical flow is interrupted. Another is called the flow, cyto the flow cytometry. Same or similar idea. Instead of the microorganism interrupting electrical flow, they're now going to interrupt some type of laser, laser light source. And any time the bacterial cell interrupts a light source, that light will bounce off, it will refract in a different direction, and the machine counts it. And I'm like, any time that light is redirected 
somewhere else, it counts it as that there's a bacterial cell present. And again, it can make a pretty accurate estimate of how many organisms are in that fluid. And another, and I might, because those both require expensive equipment that we don't have, if we wanted to do a pretty accurate count, we can use a microscope count and we can count the bacteria underneath the microscope. We use a special type of slide. So it's not your little slides that you have in the drawers in the lab, instead it's called a Petroff Hauser counting chamber. And although it's called a chamber, it's on a glass slide, except this glass slide has an etched grid on it. And you would put a drop of fluid that you know has bacteria in it, you would cover it with a cover slip, and there is a known volume of fluid that is trapped between the cover slip and that etched, uh, that etched little graph on there. And underneath the microscope, we can physically count how many bacteria are in any particular grid area. And we can start to do a little math, like, all right, so I think there's 16, I, I don't think I counted it, and I'm like, 16 bacteria in one particular grid, and so I'm like, all right, well, so I know there's, you know, 16 bacteria, and I know there's a microliter of fluid in there. I'm like, all right, so there's 16 bacteria per microliter, which would be about 16,000 bacteria per milliliter. I'm like, so we can make a, a pretty decent accurate guess, you know, a pretty decent accurate estimate on how many bacteria are in a known fluid just by looking underneath the microscope. It's a fancy little slide uh, that you can use. Other ways we can measure bacteria that require incubation. So there's a direct methods that require incubation. There's serial dilution and viable plate counts. These are my next three slides. Membrane filtration, as well as what's known as the most probable number. Now, the serial dilution. So we give you bacteria in lab already that was in a broth, and there was lots of bacteria in it. It was very cloudy, lots of bacteria in there. And if we poured just a little bit of that fluid on the plate, there would be so many bacteria on there, you would never be able to count them all. You'd be sitting here forever counting dots. I'm like, however, that's where we get to the dilution part of serial dilution and a viable plate count, meaning low enough quantity, you can viably count it. So if that original, and I'm like, well, this is even, you know, a one to 10 dilution, and then we put a 10th, just a 10th of a milliliter on a plate, too numerous to count. If you diluted the original broth one to 100, and then put a tenth of a mil on there, still too numerous to count. So you would dilute again and do a one to a thousand dilution, put a tenth of a milliliter on there, and we've got 65 colonies. You can count 65. You know, if you dilute it even farther, another one to 10 dilution, so you're one to 10,000 now, eventually, you know, you count six colonies. These, these are viable plate counts after doing the series of dilution. Now, if we wanted to know then, using these, how many bacteria do we have per milliliter? We're gonna look at the 65. If you have 65 colonies, do my little math, and I did a one to a thousand dilution, so we're gonna take 65 times a thousand, but we're also gonna multiply it by 10, because I wanna know how many per milliliter, and we only put a tenth of a milliliter, so that's one tenth of a milliliter, so I have to multiply it back times 10. So 65 colonies, times your one to a thousand dilution, times 10, because we only put a tenth on there, you end up with 650,000 bacteria per milliliter. It's a lot of bacteria. I'm like, so we can make an, an estimate on how many bacteria there are in there by doing this serial dilution and viable plate count. It's not done all the time, only because that's a lot of tubes and a lot of plates to set up. Another way we can make estimates is known as the membrane filtration. This is used when you have a large volume of a sample and you don't think there's a lot of bacteria in your large volume of fluid. A lot of times this is used for environmental samples. If we're gonna take um, some pond water, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of bacteria in a milliliter of pond water because a milliliter is not that much. Instead, I'm like, I could take a liter of fluid or two liters of fluid. I can run it through this filtration system. So all the fluid goes through and any bacteria that's in that fluid gets trapped on this membrane. 
it grows on this filter. We put that filter right on top of a media, make it happy, and then we grow it up. And then the next day we can count how many bacteria colonies form. So we can say, well, there's like 80, I haven't counted them. We could say there's 80 bacteria and I put two liters of fluid through here. So 80 bacteria per two liters or 40 bacteria per liter of fluid. So we use this when there's large quantities of fluid that we don't expect a lot of bacteria to be in. There's my little math. And then the last way, and I'm like for doing counts that uh, require incubation, it's called the most probable number method. We use this when the microbe can't grow in an auger and it has to stay in some type of liquid. So we're not gonna be counting colonies on any type of plate. As we would still do cereal dilutions but we would add some of that dilute, you know, each of those diluted samples, we would add it to various types of media that have some type of pH color indicator or some other color indicator. Uh, and then after incubating it, we're gonna look to see how many of the bacteria show us color changes. The more bacteria that's in there, the more color changes we're gonna see. And so undiluted is gonna show us four out of the five are gonna turn color. After starting to dilute, only two out of the five. Even after another dilution, one out of the five. Now, and I'm like doing the math on here. It's a little crazy math. And so there is a table, it's a most probable number table that all the math is already figured out. You just have to, you know, put in how many tubes you set up, how many changed colors with how many dilutions. And the table gives you an estimate of how many bacteria are in there. And then the last way we can measure microbial growth, uh, these are indirect methods. So we're not gonna do direct counting. I'm not gonna give exact numbers. We just wanna know if there's a lot of bacteria or little bacteria. I'm not looking for an exact number of bacteria. I just, these are ways to indicate that growth has happened. One is metabolic activity, which is usually gonna show up as a color change, but we can estimate the number of bacteria that are there based on how fast a certain substance is metabolized, meaning how fast something might change color would indicate how many bacteria are there. Again, we're not looking for a, a bit, you know, we're not looking for any particular number. We would just be like, wow, that changed color really quickly. There must be a lot of bacteria there. It's really all you're looking for. Uh, dry weight is you could grow bacteria on a plate. You could scrape them off, put them on some type of filter paper. Uh, dry them out and then weigh the filter paper and you can get an estimate on how many bacteria there just by their actual dry weight. We can also use some different types of genetic methods. We can isolate DNA sequences of some of these bacteria. These are usually bacteria that we can't grow in a lab. So we don't have plates, we don't have media, we don't have any types of tubes we can grow them in, but we can isolate their DNA and again, the more DNA that's present would indicate the more bacteria that are present. And the last way we can indirectly measure that growth has occurred is turbidity. And we do this one the most in lab. The more bacteria there are in a broth, the more cloudy it will appear. And I'm like, this is why I know there were lots of bacteria in those broth tubes that I gave you uh, in lab that we've used before because they were extremely cloudy. I'm like, now there are ways to measure cloudiness. There are machines that can, that shine light through. And if there's not a lot of bacteria, light will shine right through that tube of bacteria uh, or tube of broth. And I'm like, if there are a lot of bacteria present and you shine a light through it, that light's not gonna all shine through. It will bounce backwards off of those bacteria. I'm like, I could just hold the tube up and be like, yes, there's lots of bacteria because it's very cloudy. So that's our indirect way of saying that there's lots of bacteria for measuring microbial growth. All right, so we finished the PowerPoint. We know how to grow bacteria. We know some of the different media that's used. We know they grow by binary fission and we've got several ways we can count or estimate how many bacteria that are present.